There we go. Uh, today, we're still in Acts. I don't know where we're going to get out of Acts if I keep going to the doctor. Uh, but around <coughs> Acts 23, uh, I'm going to sort of move quickly through some of this. We talked about Paul going to Jerusalem and how everybody said, don't go to Jerusalem. But he insisted on going. And uh, when he got there, Everybody was trying to hide him. And remember, he uh, <clears throat> shaved his head, took a vow, uh, and was in the temple. But if you look at what he was doing, he was basically going to worship. And uh, he really wasn't teaching a lot. Uh, and there's a reason for that. We'll see that today. Uh, but anyway, they came and they arrested him. Uh, they took him to the fortress. He said, let me talk to the people. And so he got out and uh, they thought he was, remember they thought he was the Egyptian who led the 4,000 Sicarii uh, and they were looking for him and the Romans was true and said, are you that Egyptian? He said, no, I'm, uh, I'm a Jew. And then later he told me he's a Roman and that upset him. So <coughs> basically He's getting ready to deal with all this stuff. And then in chapter 23, it says that a plot comes up around verse 12. It says the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. I think it's an interesting thing because it's the last we hear about the oath. And I thought, I wonder what happened to those guys who took that oath. They probably starved to death uh, because they didn't kill Paul. But... His nephew, and we get a little glimpse of Paul's family here, his sister's son uh, heard some people plotting. And he came back and told his mom, and then told, she told Paul, and Paul said, you know, they're planning on killing me. And so they send word to Felix. That his name was Procurus Felix. That's over about 23. And... They told him what was going on, and so he called two centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen uh, to go as far as Caesarea, the third hour of the night. Uh, and when you read that, you think, okay, that's a lot of people. And uh, But it helps us to understand some stuff. Uh, we, we've always said that you know Jerusalem had a cohort, and Caesarea had the most of the legion and there's a lot of confusion about how many men were in different places but we see here that if this is a cohort you know we're talking about over 200 men uh cavalry and you know hoplites or what they call hoplite spearmen uh so that's a big bunch of people and you got to think well that's not everybody because this is just who he sends to escort Paul to Caesarea. And the other thing was they must have been afraid that something really bad was going to happen to send that many men. And you got all these people. We don't know how many, but they had made a plot to kill Paul. So this was more than just a few guys you know, on the corner planning something. This was a pretty big thing. Uh, behind it was some of the people in the temple uh, you'll see the name of Ananias, and that confuses people because when you read these names, a lot of them are the same names from 30, 40 years ago, but this is a whole another generation. This is around 60 AD, uh, and so Caiaphas is gone. Uh, you've got a new high priest, and his name happens to be Ananias. That's the same name as the high priest before Caiaphas. So a lot of people were confused, but it's probably the same family. Uh, but at any rate, Paul has, you know, talked to him, and he he's a very clever man. He uses some of the the fact that some are Sadducees, some are Pharisees, pits them against each other. He gets out of there, but then they're going to kill him. And uh, so they're going to take him to Caesarea, and that's sort of what happens in that. 
Now, we get the name of who the person is who and all this stuff. And um, he comes to Caesarea in verse 33. And while he's there, it says that he learned from that he was from Cilicia. He said, I will give a hearing when your accusers arrive and command them to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. So Paul is there waiting. And instead of having a trial in Jerusalem, he said, come up here to Caesarea and have the trial here at the coast. And after five days, the priest Ananias came down from some of the elders and uh, one named Tertullius, and they laid before the governor their case against Paul. Now, Tertullius was the prosecutor. Uh, Ananias was the one that probably asked him you know, to bring the case. And they bring a case before Paul. And it says, since through we, we enjoy much peace and uh, foremost the excellent Felix reforms and blah blah blah. So he's he's bragging on the Felix Felix and saying what a great guy he is. Uh, and then he says, but here we have uh, the Jews throughout the world, the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. And by examining him, my dear self, you'll be able to find out uh, from him about him as we accuse him. So they they lay the the case against Paul. And they do it rather clumsily. And uh, the governor said, okay, Paul, you can talk now. And he says, well, I'm happy. I'm, he says, I'll cheerfully make my defense. And what he does, I'm not going to read it, it's just plain and simply, he says, I didn't do any of this stuff. I'm innocent of everything. And what's more is they can't prove he did anything. Paul says, I went to the temple. I took a vow. I didn't talk to anybody hardly. I wasn't proselyting. I wasn't uh, preaching. I was going through my own purification. And there he stands with a bald head. So it's like he did take a vow. And when you're taking a vow, you're not out doing all this other stuff. So basically Felix thought, well, I don't know what to say here. Uh, they didn't present a good case. And there's a little word in here um uh, where was it he says but felix having a rather accurate knowledge of the way and that's the christian way uh put them off saying when lysias the tribune comes down i'll decide your case then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody and have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs and after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak on the faith of Jesus Christ. So we got more people. Uh, Drusilla is Felix's wife. Now, Felix is a Roman. Drusilla is a Jew. And that's how Felix knows all about Judaism, uh, because through his wife. And so she comes, and they listen to him, and they still can't find anything, you know, that he's done wrong. Uh, and there's one little side note in verse 26. It says, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. And when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. Uh, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So this is a lot of people skip over. Uh, they think, well, he's in jail and he did this. But Felix wanted a bribe. That's an interesting side point. Uh, and Drusilla, you know, basically, if Paul had had some money, he could have bought his way out of jail and been over with. Uh, so this isn't really about a trial. Just like today. Just like today. <laughs> uh, but um, the idea that this, this took two years, a lot of people don't really sort of grasp that. Paul was in prison, but the prison he was in, it says that he's going to be kept, but let his friends come see him, let him bring whatever he needs. In other words, he's in Caesarea, which is one of the nicest towns uh, in all of Israel, and uh, he has pretty much run of the place. He's not, he can't leave, but still he's protected. 
and his friends can come see him. So in a way, he's doing pretty good. Now, they are having this trial three days after Festus arrived in the province. Now, Felix is gone, Festus is him. Felix out, Festus in. Uh, both of them Brachius. And now, Festus, uh, like I said, he's, he's gone. Uh, or Felix is gone. Festus is actually of the family name of Procurus. And the reason that's important is that puts him close to some of the nobles. And I won't bore you with all the family stuff, but uh, we're dealing with people here that they're, they're sort of Jewish and they're sort of not. They've got a Jewish wife and not a Jewish wife. But here comes Festus. And uh, <clears throat> The chief priests, principally the Jews, laid out their case against. They urged him, asked him favor against Paul, and he summoned to Jerusalem because they were planning to ambush and kill him on the way. So it's been two years, and they're still planning on killing him. I guess those guys broke their vow. Um, and he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And, and, and basically they're saying, we're going to go back and have another trial. And they stayed among them not more than eight or ten days he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took a seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. This is Festus again. And when he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around, bringing many serious charges against him they could, that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, uh, neither against the law or anything. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried on these charges? And Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal. And uh, this is where he appeals to Caesar. And this is a big deal. Uh, as a Roman, he can appeal to Caesar. And uh, verse 13 says, Now, when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to, and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There's a man left prisoner by Felix, and when I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and, and the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for sentence and condemnation of it. I answered them, and I, it's not the custom of the Romans to give someone before an accused met. It was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met. The custom of the Romans to give up anyone. Yeah. Uh, I keep reading that wrong. Face to face, opportunity for his defense. Yeah. So. A little bit about what's going on here because I think it's interesting. We've got Agrippa and Bernice. Now, Luke is writing this. Uh, the question that's never answered is, is Luke here witnessing this or did he hear about this later? We don't know. But Luke's the one writing it and he's dropping names, Festus, Felix, now Agrippa and Bernice. But he doesn't tell us anything about them. Uh, and they're rather interesting. Agrippa is the king. You remember uh, how the Herods were the king and uh, Herod the Great had died and then uh, Herod Antipas, he's dead. This is Agrippa. This is the only son. And he had three daughters. A lot of people read this and they thought for the longest time that Bernice was his wife, it's his sister, one of his sisters. Uh, and he's an interesting character. Uh, he is a Herod through and through. And he's not well liked by the people, but you wouldn't tell that by Paul. Because Paul talks to him like, you're a great guy, you know all this stuff. He's basically sort of snoozing up to him saying, you know, you can help me out here. His sister, Bernice, was only 10 years old. That's another little historical fact that escaped us for a long time until they started reading the Roman records. And she was beautiful yeah, at 10 years old. And everybody wanted to marry her. Uh, even the emperor uh, wanted to marry her. Uh, the emperor was uh, Titus, and he was a bit of a pervert. Uh, he died of some kind of sexually transmitted disease, they think, because 
he was uh, living in Capri, and he didn't even stay in Rome. He was constantly in Capri, just having all kinds of debauchery and stuff. And you know, it's like he wasn't the greatest of emperors uh, because he was never doing his job. He was always doing just crazy stuff. Uh, but anyway, he wants to marry this girl, and he does marry her in a ceremony, but he never consummates the marriage because she's only 10 years old. And so he dies, and she comes back to her brother, and he tries to marry her off to another king. I think his name was Aziz. Uh, he was from Lebanon. And I think they did get married for a while, and then she met Simon Magus. You remember the, the magician that flew? Uh, that's another little side story. Uh, she started running around with him. I mean, uh, and it's weird, this, this kid, but she travels with Agrippa. And so they go and they see Paul. And then the other two sisters, uh, he marries them off. But she is the most beautiful and everybody you know, wants to marry her. But uh, Agrippa, who is the actual king, he's exercising a lot of authority and power. And he likes it. Now, he could very easily have said, well, you know, we're going to execute this guy. But he does listen, and Paul convinces him. Paul says he appealed uh, to be kept in custody, and then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow said he, uh, you will hear him. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came to great pomp, and they entered the audience hall military tribunes, prominent men in the city. Uh, then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, Agrippa and all who are present with us see the man whom I'm about the whole Jewish people petition me, both in Jerusalem, here, and shouting out not to live longer. But I found he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. Uh, so in other words, Festus already thinks he's innocent. So then he's before Agrippa in chapter 26. And so Agrippa says to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And Paul stretched his hand and made his defense. He said, I consider myself quite fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all accusations of the Jews, especially because you're familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you, listen to me patiently. He explains how he had lived as a Pharisee, and that he was accused uh, by these Jews. And uh, he said, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposition to Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so. And he goes on and he tells you know, how he started out, how he was the guy going after him. And then in verse 12, he tells his conversion story. Now, Paul tells his conversion story three times, to Festus, to Felix, and to Agrippa. And it's never the same. And people get real upset about that. Um, it's not that it's different, it's just that he focuses on different parts. Uh, you know, the one place he says that uh, they saw the light and didn't hear the voice, another place that they saw and they heard the voice but didn't understand it. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about that, but I let me put your mind at ease. Uh, if you read the three versions uh, and look at it in the proper translation, and there's the problem. When the King James Bible was translated, they put in contradictions in their interpretation of the Greek. Now we've got dozens of Bibles, and it's been translated better. And we realize that it doesn't really contradict. However, people who don't like the Bible still say, oh, it contradicts, so it's all wrong, Paul's lying. Uh, he's not lying. He's telling his story. And basically, his story is he's on the Damascus Road, and Christ appears before him and speaks to him. And uh, it bothers the people with him because Paul is talking to somebody, and they can't see anybody. Uh, but they see a light. And one says they didn't see a light, another says they did, and they said, well, no, I didn't see a person. It's all light. <clears throat> so you got all this confusion, but it's not really confusion. 
So he tells about it. Uh, rather than focus on that, I want to focus on one thing. Uh, after he tells us, he said, I'm delivering you from the people and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes. This, well, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, verse 16, he said, But rise, stand to your feet, for I have prepared to appeared to you for the purpose to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen, uh, that you have seen me and to those for which I will appear to you. Delivering you from the from your people and from Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And verse 18, I think is, I don't know, it stands out to me. He says, uh, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Okay, that one verse sums up Paul's mission. And I often talk about the simplicity of Paul's gospel. Paul is a grand theologian, and he explains things, but his message is very simple. And that's why we talk about the simplicity of Christ and the complexity of theology. Uh, when Paul explains this to different people, he explains it to those people uh, in a way they can understand things. Same way we do. If you have a friend who is, say, a college scholar educated in religion, you would explain things differently to that person than you would to somebody who just barely reads the Bible. And the, the wonderful thing about the gospel is it works either way. Uh, now, I have to confess that when I was studying, I thought I've got to learn all of the complexities and I've got to be able to explain them. In my early days of study, uh, I consider myself an apologetic. Y'all know what an apologetic is? Remember that term? Um, I would debate anybody. I enjoyed it. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was sort of bad because I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. I loved arguing with people because it's like, I know I can win this argument. And I loved doing it. It was ego. Uh, I didn't realize at the time. I thought, I'm doing the Lord's work. Uh, but I was actually stroking my ego because I thought, I know something that you don't know. And I would win the debates most of the time. Uh, atheists were hard to debate because when you get to the point where you're winning, they say, well, I don't, I don't believe it anyway. It's over. Yeah. But as I've gotten older, <laughs> it seems, uh, I've, I've learned some things. And I learned that it wasn't about being able to be the smartest man in the room. It was being able to be the simplest and smartest. Because the great thing about teaching, the best teacher is the one who can simplify it. And that person will teach people. Now, if you want to fill in, I guess, uh, all the spaces, that requires knowledge and education. And so I've dealt with some people that, you know, I can witness to them very simply. And it's like, oh. And then there are others, they don't want simple. They want complex. And I can deal with them too. And so it works out. It's good to be, it's good to have training. Uh, Paul is that way. Paul can talk to a, a, a tent maker and share Christ with him. Or he can sit down and talk with Gamaliel, the leading scholar in Israel, and talk to him. And I think that's a good way to be. But what he does here is there's something very simple. He says, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Now, and I say this a lot, Debbie will testify, I think, for me. Uh, in talking with people, if you know somebody's at home and we're talking, I try to point out that there's only two powers at work. 
in the universe, the whole universe. God and Satan. You know what's interesting though? And tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. Do you notice how little those two names are mentioned in church? Think about it for a second. Bob talked about the devil the other day. I wonder how many other classes spend an hour talking about Satan. That's right. They don't even want to hear the name Jesus. That's another thing I've noticed because uh, you'll hear people say God and the Lord, but it's like, don't want to say Jesus. Why? Well, you know, I don't want people to think I'm one of those kooks. Why are you a kook? You know, would you call me Brooks? Or would you call me your highness? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, scared to use the name. Don't want to talk about the devil because don't really want to believe in the devil. So let's just not talk about the devil. And you're talking about strategy of Satan. Strategy of Satan is very complex. Uh, again, when I was younger and, and doing a study, I was doing this study on Satan and trying to explain it, and I suddenly realized I'm not smart enough to deal with Satan. He's smarter than me. Hate to admit it, but he is. He's been at this a lot longer. And people need to realize that, you know, we're not going to rush out there and defeat Satan in a straight up battle. Christ will, not us. We are the subject of Satan's deception, and he's good at it. And we need to realize and, and not get on the proud high horse like, oh, I'm going to deal with the devil. No, you're probably not. He will trick you. Satan is father of lies. And if you cannot trust anything someone says, how can you communicate with them practically? And that's what you got to realize with Satan. When you're dealing with Satan, half the time you don't even know it. And when you do know it, you don't know what he's doing. Because he is using the complexity of his knowledge of God. He imitates God. He impersonates God. He sounds like God. And that's what we've got to realize. When we think about the devil, don't rush off and like, oh, I want to do battle with the devil. You don't really want that. Uh, because, one, you're not skilled enough. Um, it's not our job. It's not our job, exactly. And it's like, I'm not here to save you. That's Jesus' job too. I'm here to share with you. And the other thing I think that we do wrong because we went through this witnessing thing back in the 70s and we never really got out of it. And Baptists, we saw ourselves as the great witnesses. And so we're going out saving people. Uh, I did uh, continued witness training. That was my big training. And then I did the Roman road and then I did the Nazarene uh, way. All these ways that we learn so that we can go out and we can witness to people. And um, after doing all of them, I thought, this is not right. I mean, it works if you want to convince somebody of something. Uh, I, I bet you I could go through the continuing witness training thing with you and you would be convinced. But when you convince someone, are you really saving them? Or are you just giving them something to think about? Because Christ transforms you. Knowledge doesn't always transform you. The Holy Spirit transforms you. Knowledge is sort of a step in the right direction. Uh, and I think that sometimes we have tried so hard to save everybody that we forget that it's not our job. Christ saves. Jesus came to save those that were lost. Now we say, oh, I did it. I did it. Uh, I have witnessed to people, and we are to be witnesses, but we're more like the person that brings them to Christ. 
we don't bring them to salvation. We say we do, but really we bring them to Christ and Christ does the saving. And they have to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. I've had a lot of people that I felt like I would brought them along the way and they get right there and then they back out. It's like, well, I don't want to make that commitment. Well, you can't force them. That's Jesus' job. We keep trying to be Jesus. You know, and, and we, we say things. Uh, remember back at the sermon that was preached by everybody that said, you may be the only Jesus that they see. That sounded so good. And it's like, well, actually, you may be the only Christian they ever meet, but Jesus is the only Jesus they'll ever see. And that's where you've got to get them. That's who you've got to introduce them to. That's got to be, and the way you do that is try to live a life that's different. Um, I think I learned that in Africa is that in Africa when I was preaching and when I was witnessing to the people there my words were just a waste of time what happened was while I was there I got to know people and they saw something in my life that they wanted in theirs I told you about the first sermon I preached in Africa was basically saying that I'm a Christian and it changed my life. And that's all I had to say because they were looking for something to change their life. And when they saw an opportunity to find something that would change it and they wanted to try it. Uh, so all my fancy you know, poems and words and trying to you know, impress them, <coughs> didn't have to. It was love. Simple, Christ-centered love. And they saw me as somebody who came all the way from somewhere far away. They didn't even know where I was from uh, because I cared about them. I don't know how to say this because it's, it's, it almost sounds like I'm trying to destroy our witness. But in fact, I'm trying to take it to a different level. And it's a level that is beyond study and beyond prayer it's it's with the Holy Spirit now I'm not saying study and prayer is bad it's very good it's almost imperative that we learn to pray and that we learn to study but the Holy Spirit is the source of our power and that's what we've got to get to the other people it's like we're bringing that cup of water to a, a, a person who's dying of thirst amazing thing that the only thing you start out with all this other comes afterwards it does uh, it is the simplicity again mm -hmm. it's really sort of simple Paul knows that um, it's too simple yeah, I've always some. thought it's too simple because people think well if it's just too simple it's not going to work because it's too simple no. it but when Paul says, you know, what he says here, he's, he's boiled it down to two things. There's God and there's Satan. And you've got to know that you live for God. You don't worry about Satan. Now, why is it that we do that? Well, guess what? It's Satan. Satan has a plan. And I know um, when I was... I remember the movie The Exorcist. Y'all remember that? Did y'all see it? I would. We, we had preachers marching in front of our theater, and that made me want to see it all the more. But, but I saw the movie, and I wished I hadn't, because the things in it were just disgusting. And for the longest time, though, you know, everybody talked about exorcism and demons. We still do. Uh, but I began, to, that's one of the reasons I started studying, because I thought, I need to understand this. Uh, I have, I don't know where it's at now, because I don't read anymore, but I used to read the uh, rite of exorcism in the Catholic Church to see how it was done. Uh, I read books by Walter Martin, who was an exorcist and a demonologist and talking about how he dealt with all these things. It's fascinating to read. 
uh, and I became so focused on it. And I thought, oh, this is going to be able to cast out demons. Before I realized, and I guess maybe because I did get older, I thought, why am I worried about demons so much? You know, I have nothing to do with them. You know, I'm not going after them. Um, Jesus did. And Jesus is the one that casts demons out. Uh, if you look at the rite of exorcism in the Catholic Church, um, it's interesting, but it, it's just a ritual. And it reminds me, of, remember we read about an Acts where the seven brothers were beat up by a demon? That story, the Catholic ritual, it reminds me of that because they're trying to do something that they don't really have the authority to do. Um, Paul, I mean, the demon said, he said, well, Peter I know, and Paul I know, uh, but I don't know you. And that's sort of how it is with exorcisms. Uh, but why do we have that? That's Satan's part of his plan. He wants you to try to cast out demons. Satan wants you to be focused on demons. He wants you to go hunting demons because when he does that, he's taking you off mission and off message you think you're out there I'm going to get those demons and Satan's just laughing he says these guys are so stupid yeah because we jump right into it and Satan is always doing things to trick us into doing stuff and the other thing I, I mentioned this Debbie and I were talking about this the other day about how Satan does all these good things and it's just uh, enough truth in there yeah well I was telling Debbie's my sounding board and I bounce stuff off of her and see how it sounds but I was thinking about Satan can set up a situation where you've got philanthropy you know doing good deeds rich people doing good deeds we, we think in terms of a lifetime but Satan can think in terms of hundreds of lives he could set up a philanthropical situation where this organization does good deeds for 150 <clears throat> years so that later, 150 years later, after he's got a reputation of being great and wonderful, he can slip in the perversion. And he does. Because we look at, the, well, I think I use Bill Gates as an example. Also the CRT in the patriotism. Yeah. That. Isn't that the we were talking about that about you know because we do things we think are good and we think oh that's good let's stick with that and you don't realize that Satan may be using that to take you down this path to get you away um, we were talking about patriotism about how we have the Pledge of Allegiance you know that didn't come about until the 1950s and um we had the, the, what was that other thing we said? The Pledge of Allegiance or something else. I can't remember now. But anyway, these things we look at, we say, oh, this is good. You know, we got prayer in school and we got kids saying the Pledge of Allegiance. That's good. But it also was used as the springboard for the anti patriotism. Think about this. If we had never put that pledge and the words uh, one nation under God would anybody have ever challenged it I mean we, we could still say the Pledge of Allegiance but we put God in there and that was a challenge and now it's gone they don't say it anymore now you think well Brooks that's crazy you don't know what you're talking about I'm just saying that Satan uses good to accomplish his evil by putting something in there and then telling people this is bad we should get rid of it our whole society has shifted uh, the morality we think that we're being wise by doing evil and we're saying that this isn't evil this is honest well, it's not honest it's evil but we, we change words meanings you know, we, we get synonyms and stuff, but we change the meaning of words. Um, look at 
the daily occurrence in our society. Lying is the norm. And people who lie really well are heroes. They're considered smart, intelligent, clever, because they lie well. Um, not to pick on lawyers, but the, the profession of law was supposed to be people who know the law and can interpret it to make a case. Today, that's all out the window. Today, the law is about how can you spin the law and twist it to get what you want. That case last night, I still don't know the whole story, but about a woman who was... Uh, a woman who was raped, and now she's having to challenge uh, in court the custody of her child with the rapist. And he has custody of the child. And she has to pay him alimony, And too. she's paying him alimony. Like, we don't know the details, but she is, like, beyond... If, if the law is meant to offer justice, how in the world is that justice at all? See, justice is gone. Now it's, let's see how clever we can be. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what yeah, we can do. Who has the best lawyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now we ask ourselves, where's that coming from? Yeah, but you know what? Most people say, oh, that's just some bad guy. But it's not just a bad guy. There is a spirit at work, and it's working all the time. And uh, there's others in there working with it. Yeah. Not just him. It, it's the demonic forces that are at work today that people don't want to admit to. They don't even want to say they exist, uh, are working overtime. And there's a reason for that, too. Now I'll get a little scary. Satan, it, it's said that Satan will work harder when the time gets closer. Satan doesn't know when Christ will return, but he knows that the signs have been fulfilled. Almost every prophecy has been fulfilled on the second coming. Almost so it's getting close. Now, we, we've heard that our whole life. You know, and people have been saying it for centuries. But what we have is people are preaching something they want to happen. Um, and people didn't study the Bible as well, I don't think, because it's obvious there are certain signs that have been offered in prophecy that are going to happen, and Jesus himself said, that haven't occurred. And so... We can't say, well, Jesus is coming next week. I told you about the preacher that I used to know that he, he predicted the second coming to the day. And uh, when it didn't happen, he said, uh, well, it's been changed. <laughs> He's still preaching. The Lord decided not. <laughs> yeah, changed his mind. Uh, but he's a very charismatic speaker. But I thought, dude, yeah. Bible says nobody knows. Why do you think you know? And yet, people thought he knew, and they believed him, and that he's still their preacher. Uh, but it's that's ego again. I I know I'm sort of rattling on. Maybe I need some deep well. But the focus was this right here, because I want you to focus on that and think about it. Paul is being told his mission. God, Jesus told him his mission. And his mission was to go to these people that they can turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. That is the simplicity of his message. He said, I have come that you might have life. Jesus said that. And have it abundantly. Because the opposite of life is death. It's two things. Black and white. Uh, now, in the process, like I said, we can talk more about Satan if you want to answer some questions because he has ways that Satan works 
and there's so many, uh, we can't, it's hard to keep up with them. But I wanted to stop there because uh, this story, well, I will tell you the end of the story. After he meets with Agrippa, Agrippa and uh, Festus both say, well, the last word they say was verse 32, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So he didn't do anything wrong. But he appealed to Caesar. And that's part of Paul's life story too. Next week, we get into the other aspect. This, this was the story of the trial. Next week is the story of the, the journey. Uh, and then when we get through the journey, we'll be just about through with Paul. Uh, and, the, and the book of Acts, I should say. But this journey is interesting too, so we'll talk about that next week. But it's time to go. I have to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to share and to consider the message that Paul received and consider it as the message we receive also. Lord, help us to minister, but also to witness and to bring people to you, to lead people to you so that you can save them, that you can transform them, you can change them, you can make them the people that you want us all to be. Lord, forgive us for our weaknesses, forgive us for our pride and our ego, and help us, God, to serve you every moment of every day. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Can I hear you? I mean, we got We have Carter Dobson is watching. Marsha DeVore is watching. Wesley McGee is watching. Josiah Walker is watching. Davis Pardue is watching. Bob Pardue is watching. Gene's watching. Mary Buckley's watching. Uh, pretty good bunch of people. Yeah, that's eight. Tommy Ellis. Tommy Ellis is watching. That's nine. For all you people watching, we're glad you're with us today. Thank you for watching. Uh, and I think that's most of the people that are watching. Yeah. Okay, we're blessing.